So you know what songs you wanted to use in your films. Did you encounter difficulties with the rights? No, I didn't always know what songs I wanted to use. I worked with some good uh, music supervisors and uh, sometimes I did have a kind of song. Like I knew, I mean, I grew up in, when I was a kid, it was in the 60s when I was, you know, in high school. And so I kind of loved all those 60s girl group songs and all the kind of British pop songs from that Carnaby Street uh, yeah. era. As I got older, I then kind of liked all the new wave British songs from the, you know, the 80s. But, but growing up, those 60s girl group songs really spoke to me. And, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure why at the time, but now I kind of realized that they were telling, you know, they were telling female stories and they were, uh, you know, telling stories that I related to at that time. And also, you know, some of the groups, they were, they were kind of cool. You know, they were, it was like a, cool girls, like the Shangri-Las, you know, or, you know, s some of those other 60s girl groups. So they were inspirational in the way that they could show me how, you know, different ways to, a person could lead their lives. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny that you chose the Shangri-Las as your first choice because that's just the melodramatic movie title, you know, the, the music that just kind of <laughs> yeah. tells a story. Yeah. It's yeah. just over the top and, you know, yeah. just just, I, uh, I, just girls looking for adventure. Absolutely, <laughs> which is what I was. But um, I had wanted to make a movie originally. Um, it was right after I did uh, Smithereens, my first film, before Desperately Seeking Susan, I had gone out to L.A. and taken a lot of meetings and and um, with the intention of wanting to make a movie about it, it wasn't specifically the Shangri-Las but it was sort of a, a tough girl group from Queens um, you know and I actually met with a guy named Shadow Morton who was the guy whose idea it was to put all those sound effects in like a leader of the pack and you know, the vroom vroom of the engines and the car crashes and all that. And, and, and maybe the appeal was partly because they were so cinematic. Those. Let me ask about the feelies then. How did you come across the feelies as a, you know, a student where you, was it just like, I don't know who these people are, you know, I, you're just young. Like I will ask Richard Hell to be in my movie. I will, I will get the feelies, you know, what, this is what you were experiencing. What, how did yeah. this happen? Well, there was definitely some element of like, um, especially I felt it living in, you know, the Lower East Side, that there was um, a, a kind of, uh, that people in various art forms, whether it was music or filmmaking or graffiti art or whatever it is, there was a lot of cross collateral uh, pollinating, <laughs> um, you know, and I think, you know, I had heard about Richard Hell and I and I went to see him and, and I thought he had a great persona. And I thought if I can capture that in my film, that that would make for a really interesting, uh, you know, leading male character. Um, and, you know, and, and then once you get to know somebody, you know, he said, do you want to use some of my music? And of course, I said, yes. Uh, but actually, the feelies were introduced to me by the film director, Jonathan Demi, uh, who was really wonderful and a, and a great guy who helped out a lot of uh, filmmakers when they were starting out. And he was a great music lover. And was, he in the, was he at NYU? Was he a professor there? Or, or no, was he a student? No. <laughs> no. How'd you get, get a hold of He Jonathan? was a New York film, you know, because back then still so much of the industry was based in, well, it, in the 70s, I mean, in LA still, um, but suddenly there were a couple of directors like Scorsese, um, Jonathan Demi and Woody Allen who were working out of New York. And, and uh, Jonathan Demi, a, a sort of a friend of mine named Ron Neiswanner, who actually co-wrote Smithereens with me, uh, had s sent Jonathan Demi a script. Jonathan liked it. They met Jonathan, uh, uh, Ron Neiswanner introduced me to, Demi. And as I said, he always was very helpful to up and coming filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And so first he, um, so he gave me a list of some people who he thought might be interesting. 
Uh, he's, he watched the film with me, then suggested some people. And the first one actually was John Cale from The Velvet Underground. Uh, we met and it was kind of a funky time in Kale's life, I think. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't going to be. We know what you mean by funky. I, I, I understand. <laughs> we all have those funky times, oh, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I just, you know, he was interesting, but I just thought this was not going to be a, a, a good working relationship. And then he, um, he suggested the feelies and the, and I guess their manager sent me a, a demo for the first album. I don't think, I don't even know if it had come out yet. And I listened to their music and it had such a great, um, energetic, but also uh, kind of nervous pulse to it that it just felt like the musical version of the character of Ren. And usually when you work on a movie and, and certainly on my letter movie, later movies, you edit the movie first, then you bring in a composer and a music supervisor to then help you put in the score or, you know, the, 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 the songs. Uh, but in this case, when I heard their music, I actually recut the film to fit their, you know, pre-existing music rather than the other way around. That's amazing. Wow. I know. <laughs> uh, so like a, a happy accident. I, and um, I have to ask you about this other happy accident. I mean, it wasn't a happy accident. The original, ac Richard Hell was not the original actor. You had a no. different plan. I was just, uh, I, I, yeah. Um, I just heard about this. Can you tell the story of how uh, Richard Hill kind of came into Yeah, the yeah. Well, originally, um, I, there was another actor. Actually, it was, a, I think he was French or Swiss, he had a French accent, uh, who was cast to play the role that Richard Hill then plays. And he was more of an artist. Uh, because at the time, the art scene was really exciting too. He wasn't a rocker, he was an artist, a painter. And I started filming with him and we were on the fifth day of filming and we were doing a rehearsal in the, lo the, the, the loft that was supposed to be his loft in the film. And he and the main character, Ren, have an argument and he lifts Ren up and puts her out in his fire escape and shuts the window because, yeah, to get her out of his, his yeah. loft. Um, Susan Berman, the actress who plays Ren, saw there was an open window at the other end of the fire escape and ran across the fire escape to climb back in. Didn't realize that the fire escape ended and just fell off the fire escape. I was inside watching this rehearsal. I'm storing a rehearsal, watching, and it was like a Roadrunner cartoon. I saw her running along and then just dropping off the edge of a cliff. I didn't know how far she had dropped or, you know, was kind of horrifying in a surreal way. Um, fortunately, she landed uh, on the fire escape 20 feet below and, and broke her leg pretty bad in a couple of places, and, um, but survived. <laughs> Um, and she uh, was in a cast for the next four months. And during that time, what was great, um, well, actually what could have been a disaster that I turned into something great was that I had a chance to edit the, the scenes that we had shot, see what was working, see what wasn't working, realize that the character of Ren probably would be more attractive to a, a rock and roll guy, not a painter. <laughs> <laughs> and so recast that role with Richard Hell, uh, you know, and um, and and very happy that I did. That's oh, so interesting. And if not right. for the the accident or the unhappy accident, you might never have. But, but yeah. Have, uh, but budget wise, I mean, just to think, like, all right, all these, these five days of filming, it's just, yeah. just throwing that away. I mean, that must have been painful for for a, it, a film it, student. Yeah. Because the film was done on such a low budget, it was right. a, a little painful. But what I saw was that the scenes where um, Susan Berman was acting alone were great. And it, there just wasn't, the, the other actor who played, the original actor was good. There just wasn't chemistry between them. So um, I think if I had 
if Susan had not had that accident, I really don't think the film would have had the success it then went on to have. Um, but uh, of course, I didn't know any of that at the time. I, I should. Uh, I, I'm also curious about the sunglasses that kind of that start the film. How did you come across th this pair of sunglasses? Because it, it reflects that's the you know without yeah. those sunglasses you don't have a film kind of you know yeah well you know fashion has always been really important to me because i think you can say things with with fashion and with props um in a way that um you know it's it's like visual storytelling you see those sunglasses and you get an impression about the person who might wear them and the opening of smithereens is a close-up of those sunglasses in somebody's hand on a subway platform. And then you see the character of Wren walk into frame. You don't see her, you see her vinyl black and white check miniskirt that matches the pattern on the sunglasses. And instantly, without any dialogue needed, you know she's gonna snatch those glasses and run. You just know it. <laughs> so it was a way of visually telling that story um yeah um economically did you did you have those glasses or were you looking for how did those come into like when you saw yeah, them I'll, did you I'll know you, this <laughs> i think there used to be a store and it was run by i think we found those i worked with um a costume designer named allison lancis on that uh, movie. And um, we went to um, Patricia Fields had a funky clothing store on 8th Street. It was one of the first sort of punk clothing stores uh, in the East Village. And I think we bought them there. And of course, um, Pat Fields went on to do Sex in the City and a lot of other things. But in her early days, uh, the first the reason I remember her was because of that, uh, her clothing store on uh, 8th Street. <sighs> they remind me of Melrose, and we could have gotten them on Melrose in the 80s also. Absolutely. Yeah. So Madonna's star was on the rise during the filming. Not when we started, though. Not yeah. when we started. I... Um, I knew Madonna because um, she lived three blocks away from me in New York. Uh, she lived in Soho. And I, because of Smithereens, I had friends that were part of like the downtown music scene, the downtown club scene. So I had heard her name bantied around and I knew she had a, um, a song that was playing on um, playing on MTV. And this was the early days of MTV. I think the song was borderline, yeah. but it was getting some play, but it wasn't, she wasn't a big act yet by any means. In fact, um, when I suggested her to uh, the head of Orion, Mike Metavoy and Barbara Boyle, um, they didn't know who she was and asked that she come out to meet them and do a screen test. And uh, I tell the story in the book that fortunately Barbara Boyle had a 15 year old son who thought Madonna was cute or sexy and had, you know, been a fan of Borderline or Holiday or one of her early songs and kind of pushed his mother into <laughs> wanting to meet Madonna. But, you know, maybe had it not been for that 15 year old kid uh, or had things gone differently, who knows how the movie would have turned out. But but I, again, just like with Smithereens, I knew Richard Hell was right for that role once I met mm -hmm. him. And I and, you know, my goal in Smithereens was to get his persona into the character on film. And I felt the same way with, with Madonna. I thought she knew how to flirt with the camera. I knew the camera liked her. I knew she was a dancer and, and could move. And that's really important. Um, yeah, couldn't have we, picked... we watched, um, we, we recently had uh, Alan Hunter on, uh, on our podcast and he was talking about his first interview with Madonna in 84. And so we went back and watched it and she's talking about desperately seeking Susan like it's a romantic comedy she's going to be playing like a, a Judy Holiday, Carol Lombard yeah, type yeah. role 
Uh, mm -hmm. Is that the way you were instructing her to like, this is a romantic, this is like, think of uh, screwball comedies or, yeah. you know, kind of like that. Yeah, I've, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, De Desperately Seeking Susan is a, a kind of new twisted take on an old screwball comedy. It uses, and intentionally so, it uses devices from screwball comedies of the 30s and early 40s, like mistaken identities, like amnesia. And it uses them on purpose. You know, I'm, I'm kind of doing it with a, with a bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because I know that they're devices, but I thought that they were great devices to use for for a, a, a movie with the theme of transformation, somebody who wants to reinvent themselves and be somebody else. What better way than to conk your head, get amnesia, and then become the person you really want to be? Okay. <laughs> right, and that's what. But the, I sign up for in that. This interview, she was also talking about that. Like acting is harder. Yeah. You, you're gonna have to learn how to lose your inhibitions. And yeah, I think it yeah. made her. A, she's. I mean, she kind of alludes that that made her a better performer is acting and, you know, yeah. kind of uh, yeah. losing yourself, like who you are, and becoming someone new. Absolutely, and and I think you know we had a lot of conversations and talked about what movies she should watch before we started filming. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say you know that Madonna was just you know it was easy. Madonna was just being Madonna. She wasn't. Right, right. She was. Uh, giving that persona to the character of Susan, but she was saying totally scripted lines. She was finding her, you know, that little X, her mark on the floor where she had to stand and move and the camera had to be choreographed. You know, there's a lot of technical and acting stuff involved. Uh, it wasn't just sort of, hey, Madonna, just be Madonna and we'll turn the camera on. Um, so, uh, but, but she's also, um, I mean, the one thing I realized about her is that she's an incredibly disciplined person. Uh, maybe some of that comes from her dance background or her just sort of focus, professional focus, determination, um, drive, but she was, uh, you know, um, She's very, yeah, she's very structured in a way yeah. and disciplined about how she lives her life. So you talked a little bit in, uh, and you showed some of the marketing materials. So by the time the, the film was released, Madonna was becoming Madonna and there were some of the marketing materials that only featured her. Yeah, well, what happened is, so when we first started the film and the first... Uh, day of shooting was actually the day was the shot where she's walking down the street wearing those little white gloves and eating cheese puffs um we were that was filmed on saint mark's place we were you know there was camera trucks and a crew and lights and stuff like that but no one pedestrians were not paying much yeah. attention we weren't creating much of a buzz and you know people would look oh there's a camera there's a film crew no stars <laughs> that they recognized at that time. Um, but by nine weeks later, by the time we finished uh, filming, her Like a Virgin album had, was just, was either just released or about to be released, but she had just, she had done the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And it was like watching, you know, a, a, a meteor explode. Uh, everything had changed so dramatically over those nine months so that by the end we did need security guards and the movie that had started out originally the first person cast was Rosanna Arquette as the young upcoming star uh, suddenly be you know began being referred to as the Madonna movie and that was you know, uh, just because, you know, suddenly she had this huge album and this movie was coming out and, and I, they both fed off each other. I'm curious as a, as the director, how did you handle it in the, in the end, you know, the, the, with Madonna and Rosanna Arquette, who was a, a, a you know, the actress, actor, 
Ha, and the and the especially with the materials that are featuring Madonna so heavily as the director, yeah. how do you handle that? And I I know you mentioned something about your relationship in the book with with Roseanne Arquette. Yeah, I think it was a little hard between me and Rosanna because I think I probably was not as sensitive as I would be now. I mean, I was young. I was probably naive about how to work with actresses and how they feel in the whole process. And I think it must have been hard to come on as the star of the film. I mean, it was, it was a movie that starred two women, but she was the, the known Hollywood up-and-coming starlet. <laughs> Uh, okay. And then suddenly yeah. find yourself uh, in a movie that's being called the Madonna movie. And, yeah. um, you know, I probably could have handled that with a little more sensitivity. Um, you know, something I realized as I got older and got to work with more and just had more experience working with actors. Yeah. It, have you talked about it since? Have you encountered her and have you talked about it since the movie was shot? Yeah, I did. And I was glad I did because after the movie, we, we our lives intersected. Like we were both at Madonna's wedding together um, mm -hmm. and uh, we did some press things together. But it really wasn't until um, uh, we had the 25th anniversary screening at Lincoln Center of the movie and she was there and we, you know, we were both now older, hopefully more mature, <laughs> um, uh, you know, both give or take 50 <laughs> years <laughs> old. And, um, and I think, I, and I watched it and I saw just how brilliant she was in it. Uh, not that Madonna isn't brilliant in her way, but I saw that Rosanna just, gives that character makes her so quirky and so vulnerable and has so many just wonderful little facial movements and reactions and just makes that character come alive um in ways that you know uh, got overshadowed by just the sheer pizzazz of of madonna's career at that time uh, yeah. But it was clear that as years have passed that Roseanne has gotten the recognition for the movie that she so deserves. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask about just the opening shots again for, for all of those. I mean, you mentioned Madonna with the, the cheese puffs and, you know, yeah. and Ren running down the, the streets with sunglasses. I, it, I kept thinking of Saturday Night Fever with Tony Monero walking down the street. Is that like, is this, student of film is that something you were looking for or just putting new york as the as part of the co-star in the film yeah. yeah well i i new york is always the co-star in several <laughs> of the things i've made but i always i do think about opening shots and closing shots i mean i think that you know you're it's like when somebody walks into a room if you're in a party and you first notice them you're in, instantly get an impression about that person maybe it's because of what they wear or how their hair is or the sound of their voice or whatever so first impressions are really important and then you go from there as you get to know them you may realize your first impression was totally wrong <laughs> you know but but i feel that way about the opening shot or opening scene of a movie that it 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 it's like saying, here's my movie and, you know, I'm introducing you to it. I'm inviting you to see what this might yeah. be. And so I do spend a lot of time thinking about what that, what the opening is going to be like. And in the case of Desperately Seeking Susan, um, I knew along with two of my really important collaborators, collaborators, which was the DP, Ed Lockman, and the production designer, uh, Santo Loquasto, um, I knew we wanted to create two different worlds. And in the opening of the movie, we were going to set up who these characters were. We were going to set up the kind of feminine, pastel, neutral uh, kind of world that the Roseanne Arquette, the, the, the kind of bored housewife lives in. So we set the opening scene in a, in a hair salon where everyone's in kind of peach colored smocks. Um, 
And then uh, when we introduce Madonna a few minutes later, she's in a kind of garish hotel room on the floor wearing black fishnets with a pyramid jacket and taking a selfie. So instantly you're setting up the difference between these two main characters and the difference between the worlds that they live in. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of just uh, the opening of your your book. It's by a quote. I don't know who uh, you could tell us who Rita Mae Brown is, but uh, do you know can, do you know the quote? Can you tell us the quote? Uh, yeah, something. Uh, you know what? I all right. I have yeah. it here. Okay. <laughs> um, the reward for conformity is that everyone likes you, but yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that seems to be the theme of. Well, I, of your entire life <laughs> like okay i'm go, i'm going to take the 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 path less traveled well i i i i love that quote cuz it kind of does say it all but also because i came out of the world i grew up in certainly when i was a, a, a kid was that kind of world of little boxes you know i grew up in in a 60s suburban development where all the people kind of looked the same all the houses well there were three styles of houses you could choose from so <laughs> you lived in one of those three styles and it was you know it was safe it was like a safe little protective bubble but there was not a lot of uh room to kind of to be different. There wasn't a lot of room to be different. And if you felt, I mean, in some ways I always looked like I fit in, but there was a part of me inside that knew, I didn't feel like a freak, but I just felt hmm. like I was something, mm -hmm. inside was somewhat different than the outside. <laughs> and, and and that theme has played out in, in so many of the films that I've made, That that idea of wanting to be your authentic self, that idea of reinvention, um, and the idea of, of uh, the desire to be brave enough to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, just so I know, just Rita Mae Brown, where did, who is she? Yeah, and she's an author. And um, the, she wrote a book called Ru Ruby Fruit Jungle that I remember reading when... I guess I read it when I was in college and it was um, actually, she's a lesbian. And it was one of the first lesbian. I, I don't, I, I haven't read it in maybe 40 years. I, I don't know if it was exactly a coming out story, but it was, you know, I mean, at that time, especially when she wrote the book, which I guess was in the seventies, there wasn't a lot of lesbian literature <laughs> that was um, embraced by the ma mainstream. And her book was one of the first, at least the first that I had read. Huh. Was that at Drexel or was that at NYU? <laughs> you know? uh, Not that matters, I but- I might have read it at Drexel actually. Oh, okay, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Did you end up at Drexel because it was close to home and it, and it was just an, an obvious choice or? I ended up at Drexel at that time. It was called now it's Drexel University. At that yeah. time, it was Drexel Institute of Technology. But at that time, it had a fashion program. And for me in high school, the one way I was able to rebel was was through fashion. I mean, I dressed differently than a lot of my friends and it was my way of expressing myself and I guess maybe coming from a traditional you know uh, background where women were in this you know there were good girls and bad girls you know it it gave me as in some ways being brought up to be a good girl a way to express my bad girlness. <laughs> and so, and, and it was a way to also express my art, you know, my artistic side. Um, but interestingly enough, it was still in a girly way. Uh, I mean, certainly I, you know, I loved movies, but I never would have thought that, that I could, uh, I never thought about being a film director. I just didn't know of any women film directors, certainly not American ones, except for Elaine May, the only one I had ever heard of mm -hmm. growing up. Um, so that wasn't like a career path I even thought about following when I decided to go to college. 
But fashion was, and it was through fashion and realizing that you could make the fashions move. You can allow the fashion to tell stories. Yeah. You could put fashion to music that that led sort of organically to wanting to make movies. Oh, okay. Speaking of good girls and bad girls, sex in the city. How, yeah. how, how did that, the, I mean, the pilot directing the pilot, I, I know, I think you mentioned in the book that you didn't know what it was going to be. I guess, how could you? like with Desperately yeah. Seeking Susan, you don't know what it's going to become. How did that come to you? How, how did how did you end up directing? You directed the first four, right? No, I directed the pilot and then I directed two of the other episodes, but all in season one. And what oh. was interesting about season one, which I think is the grittier season, the grittiest yeah, <laughs> season for sure. of Sex and the City, was that the majority of the directors were female. Um, there were three of us. There was uh, Nicole Hall of Center. Yeah. Uh, there was a woman named Allison uh, McLean and myself. Um, but what happened basically was, uh, you know, I guess it was my agent. I don't remember who it, it, it was exactly, but somebody sent me this script and um, I had heard of Darren Starr. I mean, I knew he had done... <laughs> A Melrose Place and worked on, you know, Beverly Hills as a whatever. Yeah. Um, but I was, uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't really watch those films. At this point, I was, you know, I don't know if I was in my early 40s or whatever, but those weren't <laughs> the TV shows I was watching. But I knew that they were popular, so I had heard of him. And when I got the script to direct a TV pilot i wasn't super excited because i really liked making movies more than at that time um the thought of doing a a, a, a tv project but i read this script and i was blown away it was quite simply mm -hmm. that you know I, I i read the script i thought it was so smart so funny so different than the way i had seen female characters portrayed in tv shows before that I said, I, I just knew I wanted to do it. Had no idea it would be a success, but just that the, the story was compelling um, and the writing was good and the characters were bold. And, and so anyway, so we said, a phone call was set up by, I guess, one of our agents and uh, it was pretty quick phone call. We, we chatted, I think he w had been a fan of Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, basically I told him I liked the script. He said, you want to direct it? I said, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's how it, how it happened. And, and making that, um, was an incredible experience because my goal and I, and I told, told him this right from the start was to try to make it like a film. So, uh, he was on the same page. And fortunately we hired um, a movie, a movie DP, a guy named um, Stuart Dryberg, who had done the movie, The Piano, which was an amazing movie directed by Jane Campion, you know, who wasn't a TV director. Uh, the, yeah. the director of, uh, the, the production designer was also a movie guy who had worked with Mira Nair on some of her films. Oh. Um, so uh, the the sense that I had was I was making a movie. It was just shorter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of the actors from Smithereens, Chris Knopf, was was in <laughs> yeah. Chris Sex Knopf. and was that just a happy accident or how did that come together? How did that happen? Well, I had bumped into him once or twice <laughs> in New York, but in in Smithereens, uh, Chris Knopf has a uh, cameo as a just hooker in a dress, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it, it was fun because I remember when I was given the script, uh, some of the, 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 the women had already been cast. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker was involved early on. Uh, uh, Kristen Davis was, uh, I guess, Darren knew her from Melrose Place. And Kim Cottrell, uh, actually, I had auditioned her years before for Desperately Seeking Susan. But uh, 
Darren had already cast her. So the two uncast roles, major roles, were Miranda and uh, Mr. Big. And so I was involved in the casting conversations for those. And of course, uh, in the script, I remember it described Mr. Big as an Alec Baldwin lookalike or something like that, or an Alec Baldwin type at that time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I remember Chris came in to audition. We chatted because we knew each other. And, uh, and I was glad that ultimately, you know, he, he felt right for that, for that role. Any of those roles, it's hard to envision anybody else in now. It's so, yeah. you know, iconic. Yeah. 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 Scripting. Um, I, I actually wanted to, when you, you had mentioned, you know, uh, that you were proud that women, there were uh, a number of women directors on Sex in the City. When you had your, you know, after Desperately Seeking Susan, you have your own like Madonna moments and you get to choose whatever film you want. Did you want to hire more women? Was there like, did you have an objective? Like I want, you know, on my next film, this is who I want. You know, I want to give opportunities to other people. I, I have always tried to give opportunities to other women because I think women do work really hard <laughs> and maybe even harder than some because they, they, they to. need to prove themselves. So I, I, I think I know I have had to work harder than some of my male <laughs> uh, compatriots just to to get over that hump, you know. Um, yeah, so I, so I have always tried to work with women in, in when I can, but I also want to work with good people. So I want to work All with right. good women. Yeah. Um, mm. but also I wanted to always make movies about women, uh, yeah. only because I think I have a take on that, that maybe some male directors don't. I mean, there's no way, you know, there's certain scripts I'll read that I'll think, well, this is a great script. Grip, but I think Scorsese is going to do it better than me <laughs> or Woody Allen or, will do that better than me or somebody, you know, some other director will, will be able to bring their thing to it. So, so I tried to choose projects with characters where I thought I could put my spin or my vision uh, into the film in a way that somebody else might not be able to do. Also, you're, the, the characters, and this is probably obvious for someone who's a filmmaker, but for me, it was, it was a, just an outsider's observation. You, the characters age really not your characters uh, in each film kind of age along with us, you know? And I, I, I mean, is it yeah. a conscious decision because this is what you know and you're not going back to direct, you know, kids when you're in your 40s or 50s? I I, I think that's true. I think because well, in some ways my films are personal, even though I'm not mm -hmm. always the writer. I, I am the person that works with the writer and tweaks and, you know, tries to overlay my stuff into the, the film. But I think that that's true, that as I've gotten older, the themes have changed. The characters have gotten a bit older. Um, because I am relating to it all in a in a very personal way, um, but that doesn't mean that everything has. You know, I have also worked with younger characters as <laughs> you know when I've gotten older. But but yeah, I mean, I I I like when films feel personal, and not just my films. I like when other directors make personal films. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what I like about Tarantino. I feel Tarantino yeah, in his right. movies um, and some of the other directors that I've loved. So, uh, yeah, maybe it's narcissism. I don't know. Probably a bit of that, but also a bit of, no, of that's what, what interests know. me at the moment. Yeah, right. yeah and it, it is what you know. It's your experience. But also, you worked with, and I, I, uh, I just watched this film, Boynton Beach Club. Okay. I, I love this film so much and I love the story about your mom, how this came together with your mom and your mom's participate participation yeah. in it. Can you talk a little bit about this? And your mom is such a fascinating character in your book, you know, in your memoir, yeah. but how okay. this film came to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a film I could have made now, now that I'm the age of those <laughs> characters. But back then I was, it was my mom's film. Um, yeah. My, my, my mother, um, 
my mother has always been an influence on me because she always encouraged me to not be afraid to fail. Maybe that's the best way to put it, you know, to go for something. And if you don't succeed or if it flops or if you, if it, if it's a disaster, just pick yourself up and try again. Mm -hmm. And so I was never, and I've had failures, you know, but, yeah. but fortunately, because of my mom's uh, advice or encouragement, I never let it let them kind of destroy me. Um, and so um, any, anyway, over the years, my mother had been sending me like cutting out articles from newspapers and sending them to me in the mail. This is free <laughs> internet, right? Um, with little sticky notes saying, don't you think this would make a good movie? And sometimes I did, but I didn't think it would, that I would be the best director for that story. And sometimes I didn't think it would make a good movie again for me or that I, you know, it didn't interest me. But one day she called me up with this story idea about, um, uh, because a friend of hers had passed away and her friend's husband had gone to a bereavement club uh, I guess he was in his late 60s, early 70s at this time. And suddenly he felt, found himself being hit, hit on by all these women at the bereavement club because there were like, you know, 20 women and three men. And little by little, he found himself back in the dating game again at a time when he realized that all the rules had changed. You know, he hadn't been on a date in maybe 30, 40 years, and suddenly he enters this whole new world. So my mother started to tell me about some of his experiences. And as she's talking to me, I thought, well, that would be cool to make a romantic comedy about older people that was about love, companionship, and also about sex, you know, um, and I also realized that there were a lot of great older actors that weren't getting movie roles anymore, or maybe they were playing, you know, the lead characters, grandmothers sitting on a porch in a rocking chair or something. But this would, you know, be a great opportunity to have these actors who were romantic comedy stars in their day, you know, play leading characters in a romantic comedy. Um, so anyway, so she told me this, this idea and I was about to leave to go to Canada to make a movie for Showtime. And I, even though I thought the idea was great, I just didn't have time to think about it. So I said to my mom, look, if you like the idea, why don't you write the screenplay? <laughs> and my mom said, I don't know how to write a screenplay. And I said, go to Barnes and Noble and buy a screenplay for dummies book and read it and, you know, and, and, and give it a shot. And uh, so I went off to make a movie in Canada. I came back two or two and a half months later and there in my mailbox was this thick manila envelope with my mom's screenplay in it. And that's exactly what she had done. Um, so I, uh, I read it and what I realized is that, you know, the story structure was a mess. There was a lot of messy amateurish things about it but it had so many brilliant moments that I wouldn't have known about um, not having gone through that experience and not being that age that I, I said, this is great. I, I, I can see this movie. Do you mind if I take it and work with a, my uh, a writing partner named Shelley Gitlow at that time? And if we can just kind of brush it up and turn it into, you know, restructure it. But, um, uh, using and trying to keep all those wonderfully authentic moments. And she said, sure. And that's what led to uh, Boynton Beach Club. I love this film so much. And the cast you have at, with, with Sally Kellerman and Joseph Bologna and, and just uh, Brenda Vaccaro. Brenda Vaccaro. Yeah, it was a, they were all like major stars in their time. And it was wonderful to get to to work with all of them. Michael Norrie was in it. He had been in Flashdance in the, he was uh, so cute. In the early 80s. Um, <laughs> and and the, the film is set in one of those gated communities, uh, 50 plus adult only communities mm -hmm. 
uh, in Florida. And so it was kind of a wonderful, colorful setting um, to, uh, you know, almost like a, you know, all those those um, communities have these fantasy names like Valencia Isles and Palm, <laughs> Palm Breeze and, you know, these kind of magical fairy tale names. <laughs> yeah. So it, it seemed like the perfect setting to uh, to do this kind of romantic comedy. Yeah, I guess. And your mom's been in this for your entire career. She was in Act Like One too, right? Your first film, your first student film. She had a a, 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 a background action. Right. <laughs> kind of she was in there. Yes, she was in there. <laughs> yeah, actually, your your whole I have, I just uh, I do have your I got the the Criterion, so I got the. Uh, I, I saw like your 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 brothers in that film and you know yeah. and your house. <laughs> so it's like this was your this was the start of your memoir. So now I mean how can you just start what was the uh, usually it's the pandemic now. Everyone says it's the pandemic that that began the the process for your memoir was what what was yeah, the start? Yeah, absolutely the start for you? it was the pandemic. I, yeah, I yeah. mean suddenly the whole world was on lockdown and everyone had a lot of time to think about things and they weren't going out. So they were thinking. <laughs> and um, so I just started to take notes and I didn't know it was going to be a memoir. I just started taking notes on my cell phone and just the, the memories. And uh, the, the other thing, there were two other things that happened that I think also motivated me to turn this into a memoir. One was that uh, the second week of the pandemic, uh, an actor friend of mine, Mark Blum, who plays Rosanna Arquette's husband, the the spa salesman, uh, the spa king in um, Desperately Seeking Susan, he passed away from COVID. He was one of the early kind of actor celebrity vic victims of, of COVID. So that kind of you know, it, it, it makes you think about your own mortality, that th there's something going on right now and people are dying and life is so uncertain. So that motivated me. And also when the pandemic started, I was probably, I don't know if I was 68 or 69, but I was on the verge of, 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 of turning 70. And I, and I read this great quote by Leonard Cohen, the, the musician, who said that 70 isn't old, but it's the foothills of old age. And it, and it kind of is. I mean, I don't feel old. I don't feel, you know, I certainly don't feel or look like what I thought a 70 year old person when I was a kid looked or sounded like, but that six did t change to a seven. And that seven is a wake up call. It makes you just realize that, uh, you know, uh, you're in your, you know, you're in your third act. <laughs> and, um, and it is a time for re reflection. Uh, I mean, to me, it's always funny because I've seen um, and I've read some memoirs written by people who are 30. And I'm thinking, you're 30, you're writing a memoir. What are you writing it about, you know, high school. <laughs> uh, mm. it, 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 like, I don't know how much life, you know, I, th I think you can't, kind of have to live enough life and have enough perspective on the life you've led. At least I needed to have that to be able to yeah. talk about it with some distance and some objectivity. So, yeah, so the pandemic, my age, thinking about, you know, life in general, motivated me to want to write this. And, and, and another thing, <laughs> um, also thinking about how there really weren't that many books about what it was like to be a woman director. I mean, I certainly had never read one when I first started out, you know, on this journey. And I would have loved, you know, I would have loved to have read somebody's memoir saying, you know, these are some of the things, the obstacles that might be in your path. And these are some ways you might want to negotiate around some of the problems uh, you might encounter. Um, so in part, I was also writing a book. It's not exactly a guidebook, but a little bit of a, of a book to pass on some life lessons to the next generation of young women out there who were making movies. 
And I'm sure I'm sure your son appreciates it too, because you don't have a chance to talk about all these things necessarily. And your son now has a a, a record of your life, a written record of your life. <laughs> yes, I, I hope. <laughs> I, I I hope I, I I did worry. You know, part of when you write a memoir and you talk about some your personal life and some of the things you did, good and bad. You know, you you know I. I didn't want to embarrass him in any way, but I did want to be honest and authentic to to my story. Yeah. Has he given her a review? I, <laughs> I I'm not sure if my son's read the whole book. I know he's his wife has. I think he's mm -hmm. you know, I'm his mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm mom. <laughs> so uh, I, I I think he's a little nervous. So he's been reading it. In, in, in bits and pieces. Yeah. I, I, I love the way you talk about his wife, the, the praise that you have for his wife. That's really lovely. And you're very lucky. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that he picked a smart, strong, nice, kind woman. Um, and, 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 and he's kind of an evolved man. I mean, he grew up with a working mom. So uh, he, he has never been... He's uh, he knows how to be friends with women, which is something that I really love about him. Do you think you'll ever have an opportunity to work with him? I did work with him um, on a short film that I directed uh, in 2017. Uh, he edited it and and it was fun and he did a great job. But there was a little bit of that, like. I'm not mom. I'm the director. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, kind of negotiation that, uh, you know, ha had to happen. I mean, it was sort of like me working with my mom and knowing or being fearful on set that she was going to embarrass me and do a mom thing. <laughs> but she didn't. And we, we got along great on, on set. <laughs> That's good. That's kind of we, we've spoken to musicians that have uh, taken their their kids into their bands, and they're still the boss of the band. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Same yeah. kind of dynamic. Yeah, it's it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Just reminds me of Albert Brooks' mother, just that movie, and just uh, you know trying to trying to control your mom. It's like, uh, yeah. It's still, there's still that. There's always that dynamic. You're always. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've. It's been over an hour. <laughs> Do we, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this was fun. Um, Holly, I'm, what else, anything else we, we want to I'm cover? looking. I was jotting frantically notes. Um, you made the decision. You, you, we talked about New York and, uh, and your attachment to New York, but you moved. I know you, you said in the book you had this house, the, the country house, um, yeah. but you made the decision to move there permanently. I did. I, I moved out here two years before the pandemic, not knowing that the pandemic was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think what happened was, um, you know, I love New York and I still love New York, but it's not the same New York that it was when I was uh, starting out. And, and that's part of the beauty of New York. It just keeps changing. And I guess I felt at some point that a lot of the reasons that I was living in, you know, I, I lived for, I never lived above 9th Street and I lived for 35 <laughs> years in Soho. And I looked around Soho and I realized it's a different Soho. I mean, and that's, that's fine, that's natural. But um, that the, the things that I went to New York to do, I mean, I wasn't hanging out at clubs, I wasn't <laughs> going to dance at Tyria. I, I wasn't, I, you know, the art scene had changed, um, you know, and uh, so I wasn't sure why, uh, why I was living there full time. And, uh, you know, I got an offer that I couldn't refuse from uh, somebody who worked for Google. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that's who was moving into my yeah. building. It was, you know, money managers and lawyers and Google guys. And and I thought, wow, okay, I'm going to, I'll take this. And uh, 
see what it was like to, to move out to the country. And I love it out here. I still need to get my dose of New York City. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, of course, the pandemic came and, and the world changed. But, uh, you know, for right now, I mean, the irony is that I live in the country, but it, it, on, in western New Jersey. And the last thing I ever thought I was going to be was a Jersey girl, given the number of New Jersey jokes I've made in so many of my <laughs> my films um i think there's a scene in desperately seeking susan where madonna walks into the magic club and the cigarette girl says to her hey susan everyone thought you were dead and madonna answers no just in new jersey and <laughs> i um but but when i lived in manhattan my idea of new jersey was exit 13 on the new jersey turnpike which is where all those factories are you know you kind of ha had to hold your nose when you drove through ex by exit 13 on the turnpike and then i realized that there's this whole other part of new jersey which is why it's called the garden state which is western jersey which is the farmy part <laughs> and it's quite beautiful it kind of looks like uh, more like england than it does like new jersey or my impression of new jersey but, uh, you know, life is full of ironies, and I'm now a Jersey girl. <laughs> and what, what are you doing to keep those uh, creative juices flowing? What's, what's your, uh, your Besides life? writing a memoir? <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's <laughs> yeah, done now. We, we move on to the next thing, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny because now that I, I, I spent the last couple weeks on doing this book tour and, and doing interviews and, and stuff and, and talking about the book, but I'm now, you know, it's like a, a physical thing. Your body starts to tell you when it's time to, to do something new. And so I found myself starting taking notes again on my cell phone, as I had done before. And I, at this stage, I, I, I'm not sure where the notes are going to take me. And I don't know whether they're going to be a screenplay I, or a book or stage play I don't, I don't know what they're going to be but i am physically feeling in my gut the need to take notes about stuff about the world that that i'm experiencing that's great uh and uh i you know i hope they'll turn into something in a year or two from now are you and doing this... like a, oh i was gonna say are you doing like a book tour or are you just doing like zoom thing are you able to are you go into bookstores and and I, seeing the I world am, out, doing the, the, I'm doing the band tour. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the weird thing is because um, I'm New York based and because the publishers is, is East, you know, on the East Coast, I've been doing the East Coast, but I am in the process of talking to uh, somebody out on the West Coast um, about what, what I was doing here basically with screenings and book signings and talking yeah. and, and Q and A's. But I'd like to do that on the West Coast, too. And what I'd like to do is uh, hook up with some um, theaters in L.A. to do that same thing. And uh, the one, the weird thing that I realized in writing the book and in doing this East Coast part of the tour was that uh, a lot of the uh, interviews that I did, they talked about a film that I had made that I always liked that got totally lost in the shuffle. It, it, it was a commercial flop and it's called Making Mr. Right. And it starred John Malkovich and, and Anne Magnuson. Yeah. And in a few of the um, press things that have come out about my book and, 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 and me, the, the journalist references this movie and says, I had never seen it. Uh, she, the, the journalist had never seen it, uh, but went to see it and they were blown away by how funny and contemporary they thought it, were, it was. Because mm -hmm. essentially it's a sci-fi AI rom-com. It's about a woman who falls in love with an android. And um, so I want to kind of do some screenings of that movie out in LA uh, with Anne, with the actress Anne Magnuson and, uh, you know, in conjunction with the book signing. Ooh, that'd be nice. I see, the yeah. LA Cinematheque, yeah, you could, screenings at uh, mm -hmm. the Arrow or uh, the Egyptian. 
I, I could see, yeah, well, you got well, one of the on it. That I'm, yeah, I'm on this. <laughs> I was just put in touch with somebody from a, a, a theater, um, Vidiots. Yeah. Oh, Vidiots. Yeah. That Vidiots. Was a, like it. Yeah. That's kind of like a, oh, what was the, the New York video store that was like famous? That was in the, uh, the lower, it was like on the, on the West side, there was, uh, some famous video store that everyone went to. There was a documentary about it too. You know? Oh really? Okay. They now have a big theater, right? Are they? Are they might. There, uh, there's a screening at, at Vidya since they've moved. They moved to the east side to, like I think Los Feliz or yeah, yeah somewhere around there. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, just music, music or movie geeks that uh, that like that like uh, quirky films. Yeah, so, yeah, this, that could be there's great. There's a couple other places. Is there? I think the uh, is it called the. LA is it the Cinematheque or something like that? Yeah, LA yeah. Cinematheque. That's that's yeah. why I subscribe. That's they sh they have screenings in Santa Monica at the Arrow and in Hollywood at the Egyptian. Yeah, uh, and they yeah. have directors. They're all there's. Yeah, get it. Get in touch with them. They're they're good people. Yeah, the, in fact, they a friend of mine who's a director, um, um, Allison Anders, mm. who uh, yeah. just had a, a music and film kind of festival there. And they actually show Desperately Seeking Susan and Smithereens as part of that festival. So don't now- Don't knock the rock, that's it. Don't knock the rock, don't knock the don't rock. Don't knock the rock, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, I'm great. hoping to make it out to LA because I really feel like, um, you know, this book is also about the movie, you know, it's about the movie industry and I spent a lot of time out there, so. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Your films have had a global impact, so you're, uh, I mean, fans all across the country, I'm sure. Thank you. Would, no, would I, welcome I, you I, happily. I, I haven't been to L.A. I haven't been anywhere much in in, in uh, the last five or six years, so um, I'm looking forward to seeing how L.A. has changed. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Uh, yeah, Allison wrote a nice little blurb uh, about the book, so... Uh... That, yeah, oh, that's that's not. I mean, yeah, she's. I'm sure inspired by, by your work amazing. as well. Yeah, just yeah. you know, keeping it sure. Going. Yeah. Um, uh, well, thank you so much, Susan. This was really wonderful. I really appreciate the time you spent with us. Thank, thank you, guys. You. And, and I hope if I blab too much, you'll cut that out. <laughs> just feel free to edit me. <laughs> all, all good. All good. <laughs> Dave's a masterful editor. It was, this was so delightful. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> where do I, when does this? Uh, <laughs> well, yes. Where, where do I, when do I, when do, uh, actually, I think it'll, it might, uh, I think we have you for ne actually next Friday. We release them on, on, uh, on Fridays. And I think this one will actually come out next Friday. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. It's like a quick, we got a quick turnaround here. Um, wow. Okay. Well, but, well, again, I know uh, I have a tendency to ramble, so please. No, no. Yeah. That, don't worry. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to sound like, yeah, you'll be a genius. You sound like uh, very articulate and uh, concise. <laughs> and hopefully there's like, nothing you, you look back on and wanted to, to, uh, cut out. No. Do you like, <laughs> do you like your... edit? I, did you like the editing process? I know you did that like earlier in your career. Do you like I that? I do. I mean, this is, I don't know if this is part of this. This is just talking to you guys now. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah, I do. I think editing is really important and not just in film editing, which I, and I love that you get to, you know, like you can pick from seven takes and six of them can be really shitty, but that one is, is good and, and no one will see the other six. And you can, you know, and, and I find that also uh, being a, um, knowing film editing really helped me in writing the, my memoir because I wasn't afraid to cut stuff out, even stuff I liked, if I thought it just, I liked it, but it, it, it went off on a tangent in a not good way or knowing when to end a, a chapter. I mean, I don't know if I was totally successful in all that, but I, but I tried to, yeah. to not be afraid to cut stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, and I once heard some writers say, you know, a good writer is a, a good writer is a good editor. And I kind of <laughs> feel that's true. 
Did you have so when you were working with an editor with your with the publisher when and you know this person was making notes and telling you to take things out was that like yeah, well I I was, helpful, like, I did a lot of my own editing quite yeah. quite frankly my, my editor was great but I thought she was gonna like rip this to shreds and uh, you know she you know she was good but. Um, but there wasn't a lot of su substantial editing. There was, you know, I messed up words, I messed up tenses, you know, that kind of stuff, technical stuff. But the book okay. is not that much different than the draft okay. that I turned so, in. Okay, right. So you didn't turn in a, your 600 page manifesto and- uh, <laughs> I, I, I wrote the 600 page, but then I edited it back down to the- but, and, then, and then you chopped it up yourself. Oh, okay, that's, oh, that's I did, great, yeah. Yeah. Look yeah. At, yeah, see, you are a math master at that. If I ask you a question for, for the for the podcast or not, um, the story you told about Jan that you included at the, the, the uh, your... Um, yeah. yeah. Would you, knowing how, uh, how life has progressed for women, in hindsight, had you known what, what we know now, would you have said anything back then? I hope so. I hope I would have. I really do. I think women, it was so different. We're, 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 we're talking about mm -hmm. my Me Too moment. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, women were so much uh, uh, felt guilty. You know, they felt like yeah. if they did something that maybe... And, and, and there was sexual harassment involved that maybe they were somehow incited it or, you know, unknowingly motivated it in some way, yeah. which is totally the wrong way of thinking. <laughs> Thankfully, women don't think that way. Yeah. Men don't think that way these days. But back then, it was just a different world. And I think I felt, you know, that whatever happened to me, that I was complicit in it in some weird way. You know, it's it's uh, like a girl who wears a bikini and then, then gets raped or a girl who, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just a very terrible way to for, for women to to have thought about. Well, we were we were programmed that way. And, and yeah. who even knows how it began? Like like we should be embarrassed for something like that happening to us. Yeah. When that's yeah. exactly the opposite. I, and we've all had, I, I think the majority of women have had some kind of experience, maybe oh. not to that degree, but have had experiences that some were still embarrassed, you know, to talk about, but we yeah. should be talking about it, even though I don't believe that's going to happen to this generate this new generation of, of, of women coming up. Okay. I think there will be much more talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hope so. Um, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. when when I had that experience, that really, you know, yeah. Anyway, I, you know what? I'm gonna leave it at that. I yeah. Mean, no, I, I'm sorry. I... But you know, you were saying about my son. I mean, that was, and and this is off the record. Yeah. Now, but yeah. that was sort of one of the stories that I wasn't, you know, that I I wasn't sure about how to write it or to include it because. Yeah, I knew my son might be reading the book and I didn't want to upset him or yeah. or upset myself. <laughs> I understand that. And that's why I appreciated the way you you included it at the end, that it was an addendum that you decided that it was a good idea and a good uh, a good idea to include it. Yeah. And I also wondered how he would perceive it. But hopefully this generation will perceive it as I can't believe this happened. I know you're the mom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm glad, but not glad to know this happened to you. And it makes him a better, stronger, more aware person. Yeah, I'd like to think so. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Anyway, thank you for sharing it. We don't have to include any of this. I just was, yeah. I wanted to know for, my, for myself. I thought it was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd rather people just read about it because it was yeah. such a weird thing that it sort of needs to be in the context of the book. Perhaps. Yes. Of know. course, of course. And anyway, I just appreciated the context in which you, you added it. So thank, thank you for that. You. Thank you. And thank you for spending so much time with us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, but and hopefully we'll yeah. see you here soon. 
that okay. video store okay. it, that video store is Kim's video. Did you did you know Kim's that place? Course. I lived around the corner. It was on Bleecker Street. I knew Kim's there we go. video. But was that there's that, a documentary that on that video. That was Vidiots? No, no, <laughs> that's there's a documentary on Kim. That's so it's like oh, the Kim's West video. Coast. Yes. The yeah. West Coast version is Vidiots. And yes. So, yes. They had independent film sections, like with different independent yeah. filmmakers. Mm -hmm. They had their own little section. Kim's video is, yeah. I mean, that's how I got my, uh, well, VHS <laughs> education. <laughs> yeah. And then DVD. But but I, I remember the VHS lineup, uh, and I got to catch up on all the films I hadn't been able to see when I lived in Philadelphia. Yeah. 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 Essential. Yeah. There's so there's a documentary on Kim's video in case I'll you check that want out. to thank check that, one, that out. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So again, thank you so much, Susan. It was wonderful. The book, Desperately Seeking Something, a memoir about movies, mothers and material girls. Um, and it was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You yeah. That. We really enjoyed ourselves. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Susan. Take care. OK. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, stop. Okay. Let me do that too. Hang on.